And uh, we <clears throat> we're going to look at the latter years in David's life. We're, we're going to begin in uh, chapter uh, 13, and we're going to uh, skip around. Last week we looked closely at, uh, at the incident with Bathsheba, and today we look at the aftermath of, uh, of that incident and uh, the remaining years in, um, in David's reign. Following the Bathsheba incident, um, we, and we already hinted at this last week, but um, David's son Amnon uh, abused his half-sister Tamar, and that's in Second Samuel 13. Very quickly, let me just tell you the story. Am, Am, Amnon was one of, the, one of David's oldest sons. And uh, he, you remember David had uh, almost, at this time he had about a dozen wives and several children by them. Um, Amnon was one of the oldest, so he would, he would have been a, a contender to assume the throne after David. Um, not only that, uh, he, he had already surrounded himself with influential friends. One of his friends, a very ungodly man, and we talked about the importance of having godly close friends. Amnon had a very ungodly close friend. And so Amnon happened to mention to this friend of his that he thought his half-sister, Tamar, was really attractive. And Amnon says, well, you're the son of the king. What's stopping you? And so together they plotted uh, to, uh, to, to get her in a vulnerable position and take advantage of her. And here's how he did it. Uh, Tamar was a good cook. So David sent word to his dad, uh, excuse me, Amnon sent word to his father David saying, I really enjoy Tamar's cooking. She is such a great cook. And I'm, I'm, I'm ill. I need some chicken soup. And I sure appreciate that if you'd send Tamar to cook me a meal. David, thinking nothing of it, sends his, uh, Tamar there to cook him a meal because he's sick. Tamar gets there and unbeknownst to her, uh, uh, Amnon had told all the servants to leave the house. So she's alone with him. And when alone with him, he locks the door and abuses her. Uh, she tries to stop him, says, this is, this is unheard of in our nation, in our culture. This is unacceptable. She even goes as far as to say, if you ask for my hand in marriage to, to our father, maybe he'll give it to you. But that is not enough to stop uh, Am Amnon, and he rapes her. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to even have to mention that in, in polite company, uh, but it's part of the story, and it's an important part of the story because it tells us about the depravity of, of the human heart and the, and the influence of sin and what sin can do when unchecked. Well, to make matters worse, after abusing of his half-sister, uh, Amnon, uh, excuse me, Tamar is obviously devastated. She's physically and emotionally hurt. But uh, Amnon, excuse me, ta yeah, Amnon chases her, literally chases her out of the house, kicks her out of the house, and tells her, I never want to see you again. And the Bible says something uh, ugly, and it just, it's recorded in the facts. The Bible says that Amnon hated Tamar with a greater passion than he felt before lusting after her. And it gives us, and, and this is an insight to what sin does. Sin is a compelling force dragging us against the will of God and into ugliness. If you give in to sin, it only gets worse. So it, as if it weren't bad enough that he violated his half-sister, now he adds insult to injury by dishonoring her, disrespecting her, and literally throwing her out on the street. Well... Word gets to Absalom, and Absalom is Tamar's full brother and Amnon's half-brother. Absalom is also one of David's oldest son, so he is also a contender for the throne. Well, he's very upset, and he takes Tamar into his own care. Remember this, because we're going to come back to that in a, in a later chapter, because there's a very tender thing about that Absalom does, and we'll get to that in a second. But Absalom takes on Tamar and cares for her and shelters her. And then he expects David to do something about it. 
And David, for whatever reason, does, does not do anything about this. It may be that it, we, we don't know. We don't know. We could speculate there were other things going on in the kingdom. There was still a war going on. Uh, it may have been his sense of inadequacy because having just had the affair with Bathsheba and all that transpired, maybe he didn't, f- didn't feel moral strength to deal with the situation. Maybe it was, he was emotionally weak at this time. Maybe it was an attack of the enemy. Maybe he just wasn't a good father. We don't know, and frankly, we can't assume a reason, but maybe it's a combination of all these things. Whatever the reason, David did nothing. And Absalom waited for two years, and then he couldn't wait any longer. For these two years, he nursed this anger and his bitterness towards his dad, and especially towards Amnon. So when nothing happened, he decided to take matters into his own hands. That's always a bad idea, but he did it anyways. And I can, you, can, you can sympathize with, with, with what's happening here. There are, no heroes in, there are no heroes in this story. Sin had made a mess of things, and it, everywhere you look, it's just ugly. So M, uh, uh, here's what Absalom does. He sends a letter to his dad and says, Dad, I'm planning a big barbecue and I would love to have all our family over. I want to feed everybody. We want to celebrate. Just have a great time together. It's harvest time. It's, it's warm outside. Let's have a big, big party. And David says, well, I can't go, but I'll certainly send your brothers and sisters. Well, everybody shows up for dinner. And as they are feasting, um, and this was all pre-planned, Absalom slaughters um, Amnon in front of the rest of the family. Now, imagine the horror of this. They're sitting at a table eating, and a brother kills the other brother in front of everybody. And it's ugly. It's, it's horrible. And it's happening in the, in the, in the family of David. It's, it's, it's really ter- a terrible thing. Well, uh, after killing, now, everybody runs away after Amnon is killed because they assume, oh, this is Absalom because he wants to secure the throne. David is getting older. He wants to secure... Remember we talked about this, how it was a custom at the time and it still is in some places today that you just kill the competition to assure the, fa- uh, assure the throne for yourself. So that's what people assumed initially. And, and, and so everybody is panicking. Everybody is running away, calling 911. And, uh, and, and then somebody realizes what's happening and says, no, 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 nobody is in danger. Absalom is not after the family. He, this is revenge for what happened. And, and people realize that he was just after Amnon and everybody calmed down. But now Absalom it, understands that he's persona non grata in the kingdom. And so he flees. And where does he go? He goes to the home of his grandfather, who is a king in a, in a, in a, in a neighboring country. And there he, he will stay. Uh, verse 28, 2 second, uh, Samuel 14, 28. Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem. Oh, excuse me, I, I skipped something important. Absalom, Absalom fled to the house of his grandfather, and there he stayed for three years. After three years, he comes back. And just in passing, one of the instrumental persons in bringing him back was Joab. Joab was the, remember, the, the, the mighty warrior by David's side, the general. Joab says, uh, David, this is not right. This is your son. He's one of your oldest son. He's heir to the throne. This is just not right. Let's bring him home. And Joab harangues David long enough that David, uh, by the way, the Bible specifically says that David was weeping for Absalom. David uh, wanted Absalom back, but he didn't know how to do it. Um, uh, I think I, maybe I should read that verse for you, because I, I want you to get the full picture. Uh, David wants to, to, to do something, and he just doesn't know what to do. Uh, verse 39, 2 Samuel thirteen thirty-nine, And King David longed to go see Absalom, for he had been comforted concerning Amnon, because he was dead. So after, after getting over the grief of losing his, uh, his oldest son Amnon, he is now longing to see Absalom. But he, can't, he doesn't know how to handle this. He doesn't know what to do. And Joab steps in. And Joab will be instrumental in bringing Absalom back. Absalom comes back, but David doesn't, still doesn't, can't find... Can't, but David still can't find a way... To, um, to, to meet Absalom once again. So that's verse 28. 14, 28. Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. 
Then the king summoned Absalom, and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before, before the king, and the king ki kissed Absalom. Now, let's piece this together again. He spent three years with grandpa out of the country and then came back and then spent two years in Jerusalem living next to the king, but the king still wouldn't see him. So five years have gone by before they are finally reunited. And by the way, the only reason they were reunited is because Absalom kept har uh, uh, harassing Joab and saying, Joab, would you get me an audience with my dad? Uh, Joab, would you get me an audience? And Joab kept saying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Absalom gets impatient, and here's what he does. He goes to Joab's farm. Joab had a huge farm. He sets Joab's farm on fire. And Joab comes back to find out, and, and Joab is a mighty warrior. He's, he's ready to chop some heads. And, when, and Joab finds out that it was Absalom, the king's son. And he goes up and says, What's up with that? What did you do? Why did you burn my farm? And, and, and Absalom says, well, I've been waiting for three years to see my father, and you've been saying you're going to get me an appointment to see him, and I need to see him, and I want to see him now. So Joab goes to David and says, your son needs to see you. So they finally meet after five years. And Absalom breaks down. David breaks down. They hug each other. David kisses him. I believe this is a sincere ki kiss. But again, this is a picture of I don't know what to call it, but unresolved conflict, a, a dysfunctional family. This is human beings being human beings, folks. And, and, and it's, it might as well we face this ugliness because this is the world we live in. Even with the great ones. I have, I, I have you know me, I have the highest regard for David. And yet this is, this is the kind of stuff that's happening in his life. Because he was human just like all of us. I had a great professor, great wise man, writer of many books, PhD, uh, again, a man of great stature in my eyes, but I remember him saying this. Uh, he said, all of us are statues of gold with heads of gold and clay feet that go up to our chins. <laughs> I thought to myself, I resemble that. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, it, the what happened afterwards is, you think, well, this is bad enough and it stops here. It doesn't. The next chapter, chapter 14, actually the end of chapter 14, will tell, tell us of another ugly chapter, which was this. Absalom was a gifted man. As a matter of fact, I want to read these verses to you because they're going to be important in a minute or so. Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 25. Listen to this. Now in all Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there, were, there was no blemish in him. Now, if the Bible says there's no blemish in someone, wow, that is saying something. Physically, he must have really been a sight to see. This was a good-looking guy. Verse 26, and when he cut his hair, one of the ways that people's vitality was measured then was the thickness of their hair. Oops. All right. <laughs> And when, <laughs> you, you weren't supposed to catch that. <laughs> and when he cut the hair of his head, at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. And when he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels according to the king's standard. Three pounds of hair. At the end of every year when he cut his hair. Three pounds of hair. Before cutting his hair, you can, you can see him strutting his stuff around and just in his hair. Um, and now, remember I mentioned something tender about Absalom. This is a human being as well. A fallen, depraved, sin-stained, but he's still a human being. And, and look at, at, at this tender uh, uh, aspect of his life. Verse 27. And Absalom, and to Absalom were born three sons and one daughter. Guess what he named his daughter? And her name was Tamar. You remember who Tamar is? That's his sis. That's his big sis that was raped. So he has a daughter and he names her after her aunt, his sister. I just think that's tender of him. And it shows his heart. He really loved his, 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 his sister. And he was really trying to protect her and restore her honor by naming her first daughter after her. Um, and so... 
In these two years, here's this good-looking guy. He's tall. He's, he's handsome. He's attractive. He is the king's oldest son, so he's the heir apparent. He's got this long hair that he struts around, and boy. Now, we've seen someone that looked this good before, haven't we? Remember? Solomon. Excuse me, um, Saul. Remember Saul was the best-looking guy in, in Israel? He was the tallest, and the Bible talks about his hair as well. The Bible says that David was a good-looking guy. He was ruddy. He was, uh, had a fair complexion. Um, beautiful people, be careful. Because <laughs> apparently, um, well, let, let, me, let me get to that just in a second here. Because we're going to come back to this in just a moment. It's not our main theme, but it, it's important. Um, Joab had, uh, excuse me, Absalom had this gift. He was a good-looking guy. He was attractive, and he had, had this long hair. Anyways, well, he started using his gifts. And uh, we could talk uh, about the spirit of Absalom. I've, I've, I've dealt with this spirit in, in my 20 plus years of ministry. And it's an ugly spirit. He was a good looking man, but he allowed himself to be taken in by a spirit of rebellion. Um, and, and in verse 6, the Bible says, Absalom behaved in this way toward all Israel who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. How did he do I'll just tell you. Here's what, what he did. He lived next to the palace. When anybody came to see the king, um, and he would make sure that they, well, he stood before the palace. And when people came to see King David, they would pass by him first. And because he was heir apparent to the throne, they would bow before him. And they, he would rush the person and say, no, 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 don't bow before me. And who am I for you to bow before me? I'm just another guy just like you. And he'd be really nice to them. And then he would hear their cause. Well, I'm coming here to see the king because I had this and this. And, and he would say something like this. Oh, I wish I was in charge. Because I, if I was in charge, I would take care of this. You no know, problem. I see the problem and you're absolutely right. And something should be done about this. And you know what? Just, just go and talk to the king. Who knows? Maybe, maybe you'll get lucky today. Uh, and, he, and he undermined his own father. And stole the hearts of people. People walked away th saying, wow, you know, maybe if Absalom was the king, I'd be better off. I would have, my voice would be heard. Well, a couple year, fast forward a couple years, and Absalom has uh, uh, one of his close friends sound the trumpet in the middle of the town and say, all those who are in favor of Absalom, come after me. And... To our surprise, the people went after, went after Absalom. And David literally had to run for his life. Because word got to him, Absalom has gathered an army around him, and he's headed, they're headed to the palace. David has no time to react. The rebellion happened too close to home, too close to the family, inside the capital, and he had no time to react. So what he does, he runs off the city. Literally, he runs off the city. He can't... Uh, gathers very few things and, um, and runs off. And by the way, he will be um, sponsored, he will be supported by a few people that came to his aid. I wish we had time to explore that because that's a, a beautiful story in and of itself. The people who came when the chips were down and said, David, we're standing with you, we'll take care of you, we'll feed you, we'll help you, we'll, we'll fight with you. And uh, to make a long story short... Um, the, uh, David was eventually able to gather an army. Joab was again by his side. Faithful Joab. Joab had many faults. He was an uncouth, he was an, an, an un, unbridled fighter. And he made some, several mistakes. But he had one virtue. He was faithful to David. He rallied to David and says, we're going to turn this thing around. And so Joab uh, gathered the army and went to fight. David want, wanted to go, by the way. Which suggests that maybe he learned something with the Bathsheba incident. He says, I'm not, don't leave me home by myself. I'm going with you guys. And they turn to him and say, no, you can't go with us. Uh, you can't go with us. If something happened to you, and here's the phrase they use. I love the phrase. They said, we don't want the lamp of Israel to go out. You are the light for our nation. We don't want you to die. We don't want this light to be put out. So they will restrain him and go to battle. Now, Joy, excuse me. David says before they leave, whatever you do, do not kill Absalom. Do not, and he repeats it. He stresses it. He says, do not kill my son Absalom. Joab heard it. Everybody heard it. Well, they go out to battle. Absalom is riding a mule. 
Why is he riding a mule? Because he's an inexperienced wannabe. Had he been a warrior, he would know that when you go to war, you ride a horse. Horse are the, is the animal of choice. He's riding a mule into the battlefield. Horrible mistake. Mules don't handle battles very well. Here's what happens. He runs, in, literally, he runs into a tree. A, a horse would not do this, uh, or at least not a horse trained for war. A mule will. So he runs into a tree, and remember his long, beautiful hair? It gets caught in the thicket of the tree, in the, in, in, the, um, in the branches of the tree. And it is so bad that he can't untangle it. Guess what? One of the armies of, one of the soldiers in David's army sees it and runs back to David, but is intercepted by Joab. And he says, why are you running? Well, I just saw Absalom, he's hanging by a tree. Did you kill him? And, they, and the soldier says, of course not. Didn't you hear David? David says, do not touch my son. Whatever you do, do not touch my son. Of course. And Joab turns to him and says, well, I would have given you $500,000 uh, for, for having killed Absalom. What are you, what's wrong with you? And the soldier says, you couldn't pay me enough. This is what the soldier says. You couldn't pay me enough to kill David's son. I heard what he said and said, do not touch my son. Not all the money in the world and I still wouldn't touch him. Well, you know Joab, don't you? Joab walks to the tree, takes three, not one, not two, but three um, javelins and throws it at Absalom and kills him on the spot. The Bible says he, he thrust three um, javelins into his heart, killed him on the spot. And then he sent word to David, the rebellion is squelched and um, you have, uh, your throne is yours once again. Oh, and by the way, Absalom is dead. Now... So during this difficult civil war, Absalom was killed by Joab when his hair got caught, tangled in the branches of the tree. Remember I said this, in, that we're going to talk about this in passing. Saul, Absalom's hair was his undoing. Absalom's hair was also his gift. And I think the fact that the Bible stresses his hair as his gift, is, the, the, the Holy Spirit stresses it, is because the Holy Spirit wants us to understand this, that Often it is our gift that becomes our undoing. Lucifer, the Bible says, the, the name Lucifer, by the way, means a being of light, a light being. He is called the fiery cherub. We, we believe, gathering um, information from Isaiah 24, excuse me, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, that, uh, that, Lucifer was a special kind of cherub. He was a special kind of angel. Uh, as a matter of fact, he, in Ezekiel, he's discovered as the cherub that covers. Which suggests to us that his gift was to, to cover, to protect the glory of God. Remember how in the tabernacle, on top of the, uh, of the, um, the, uh, the, um, the mercy seat which covers the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubim, two angels that cover the glory, protected the glory. Well, we believe that that was uh, Lucifer's role. That was his gift. And his gift became his undoing when he said, well, I'm so close to the throne, why don't I just sit on it? And it's, it's, it's important. I mention this again in passing because Absalom's gift, his hair, also became his undoing. And that we need to be careful that our gifts don't become our undoing. May I, may I just be plain with you? Um, the older I get, the less and less impressed I am of talent. The less and less impressed I am of talent. I, I see talent everywhere. I see talent all the time. And, it, and talent is a good thing, but it really doesn't impress me anymore. It used to, but it doesn't anymore. Because I've seen wasted talent so many times. And, and, and character is so much much more important than talent. And, and, and talent can really become one's undoing. Some of the worst things that have happened in history, in and outside of the church, happen with very talented people. Um, and, and God seems not to look for talent. Uh, throughout Scripture, He seems to, to look for, for character, for availability, for sensibility to the Holy Spirit. David understood this and he said, Lord, a broken heart you will never deny. Um, so um, it's important that we value talent in its rightful place, but understand that in the hierarchy of, of, of things, it is further, way further down than character and integrity. 
And uh, Absalom had uh, talent, but he lacked character. And that was his undoing. At any rate, he, he died. And it's a sad chapter. Uh, he, he seemed to be a, a, a young man that, that, you know, there were some good things about him. Uh, and, and there was a lot of potential there. But um, it, never, it never flourished. And instead, he dies. Very quickly. Uh, verse 33. 2 Samuel 18, 33. Um, the king was shaken. And he went up to the room over the gateway and wept. And he wept and he said, Oh, my Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The Bible says very little after this. The Bible moves on. Let's pause here for a second. What is happening in David's heart? I think David is reliving the last several years of his life. Perhaps he's even thinking, if, if the incident with Bathsheba had not happened, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Maybe things would have turned a different way. And it seems to me that David feels responsible for, um, for Absalom's death. By the way, Joab will step in again here. And he'll say, David, what you're doing is wrong. You're grieving for Absalom, a man who rebelled against you. You're putting him up and you are putting down the people who fought for you. And uh, if, unless, you, unless you, you know, get a hold of yourself and sit on the throne again and take charge of the situation, you're going to lose your, your kingdom. Well, David seemed to believe Joab and David will wash his face and, and put on a, a, a strong warrior face and he'll step out there and he will take charge again. Just in time too, because as he is just reestablishing himself and regaining control of his kingdom, guess what happened? Another man decides, you know what? I think David is over. I'm going to take over. This, na this man's name was Sheba. So in chapter 20, Sheba plots a revolt against David. And again, people go after him. But Joab fights and Sheba is killed. Um, but it doesn't end there. Remember one of the things that, that the, uh, Nathan the prophet said to David, the sword will not depart from you. So in chapter 21, the Bible tells us of several more battles that happened in David's later years. We don't have time to read them, but I'm going to especially highlight 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 through 22. 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 through 22. When the Philistines were at war again... When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines. Notice, where is David now? He's back in the battlefield. He says, I, don't, I do not want to stay home alone. Take me with you. So he goes. But the Bible says in verse 15, as he fought, David grew faint. David grew faint. The NIV says exhausted. David became exhausted in the battlefield. This is the first time we find David exhausted in the battlefield. Then Ishbi Benob, this is the name of a giant, by the way, um, almost killed David, but somebody stepped in and saved his life. I want to take a moment here to highlight this. Even great people get tired, and even great people get old. We would love for our parents never to get old. We would love for our teachers never to get old. We would love for our pastors never to get old. We would lo love for our leaders and our heroes never to be tired. But David became exhausted, the Bible says. Even great people get tired. Even great people come to their end. Even great people age. After the Bathsheba affair, apparently David got involved in war. But at it was time for a new generation of giant killers. David was no longer physically able to do everything he had done before. It was time for a new generation of giant killers. Very briefly, I want to talk to you about the next generation of giant killers. I don't have time to go through the details. It's a message in and of itself, but the Bible will tell us here in verses 15 through 21 about four giants. The fourth one is interesting. His nickname is Six Fingers. <laughs> he has six fingers on one hand, six fingers on another, six toes on one foot, six toes on the other foot. 
So, uh, in all of these are giants. All of these are probably related to Goliath. There's good reason to believe that they are all of the same family. Um, and all of them were killed. But none of the four were killed by David. They were Two of the four, by the way, were relatives of David. The first one, uh, Abishai, was a grandson of Jesse. Uh, and so he's related to the, He's an, a nephew to David. Uh, Jonathan was also related to David. He was also a nephew of David, if I remember correctly. So uh, two of the giant killers were related to David by family. But all four of them, all four of them walked with David, served David, and, uh, and were warriors in David's army. Giant killers beget giant killers because God set in motion a law back in, the, back in the Garden of Eden that things reproduce after themselves. I apologize for that. We will take care of this problem this week. You have my word on it. Um, <clears throat> giant killers produce giant killers. And if you want to be a giant killer, find a giant killer and hang around him or her. If you want to be an intercessor, hang around intercessors. If you want to be a worshiper, hang around worshipers. If you want to be grateful, hang around people who are grateful. If you want to be a servant, hang around people who serve. Because this is the law established by God from the beginning. Things reproduce after themselves. And there are five giant killers in the Bible. One is David. The next four were all people who served with David. Notice 2 Samuel 21, 22. These four were born to the giant in Gath. And they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of David's servants. All the giant killers in the Bible were related to David in one way or another. There's a message there. Let me make this personal. I want to open a parenthesis here. I believe this church, this ministry, is at a season where we're looking for the next generation of giant killers. We're looking for men and women who will take on the baton and lead the ministry and meet the enemy at the battlefield. I am personally looking for giant killers. I am personally looking for giant killers. I am thrilled by the fact that, um, that in the last uh, 12 months, more and more people have uh, stood up and said, we'll take care of this. We'll take care of this. I'm thrilled by the fact, you probably noticed when you walked out last Sunday or the Sunday before, that it looks like we have a brand new um, patio. Uh, that didn't happen by itself. Three men from our church saw the weeds growing and stuff happening, and they said, we're going to take care of this. And they came to me and said, Pastor, we've got this. And they showed up on a Saturday, and then they showed up on a Monday, and they cleaned, they removed the weeds, they sprayed uh, with uh, the power washer, they pulled out weeds, and they came with a sand truck and put sand everywhere, and then they come with a sealer and they sealed everything. And... Um, I want to thank God for those giant killers. God, I'm not going to mention who they are because I don't want to rob from their... I don't want to rob, rob them of their reward, but they know who they are and they took care of them. And there were, I think, five men who were involved, three led and others who served. And I thank God for those giant killers. Um, I, 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 I'm glad to see people who, who are saying, Pastor, we've got this. Brother so-and-so, we've got this. Sister so-and-so, we've got this. Um, and we need giant killers. Um, and, um, well, I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> now, we close with this. Chapter 22. Let's look at one more chapter. Verse 1 and 2. David spoke to the Lord the words of, it, of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said... The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Verse 47, the Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. Hallelujah. I mentioned this today because at the end of David's life, he was still a worshiper. He is, he's going to end his life as he begun, worshiping God. By the way, if the words of first, Second Samuel 22 look familiar to you, it's because they are. It is, they are repeated in Psalm 18. Psalm 18 is Second Samuel 22. 
So David wrote a song at the end of his life, celebrating all the deliverance that God had done for his life, and witnessing once again, Jehovah is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my strength, verse 3, in whom I will always trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord, verse 4, who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. Wow. Verse 26, with the merciful you will, show your mercy, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. Verse 30, For by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. Verse 35, I love verse 35. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. <laughs> Whoa! He teaches me to fight so that I can take an iron, a metal bow, and bend it. Wow, wow. Awesome, awesome. Final thoughts. Final thoughts, very quickly. Would you stand with me? This is as much for me as it is for you. As we look at the closing years of David's life, one message, one message stands out. David's life tells us, fight on, fight on. Stuff happens. Stuff happens and life can get quite ugly. But fight on. David got discouraged and hurt and confused, but he never gave up. Remember, remember Goliath. The same God that gave you victory over Goliath. He'll give you victory over whatever it is that you're facing today. Some of the things we face are just part of living in a sinful world. Other things are brought on by our own actions. David met both giants, the ones that came at him and the ones he created himself. I suspect the same is true for me and you. We will face giants that we had nothing to do with, they just showed up and challenged us. And then we'll face some giants, some monsters that we created with our own actions. Either way, fight on. Fight on. God will see you through. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So fight on. Number two, move on. Move on. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2 tells us, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is Paul and Timothy. He came to a place where he says, Timothy, I've committed my, all, everything I knew and everything I have, I'm committing to you. And I'm going to ask you to commit it to others because I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Even our heroes eventually must move on. I heard someone say recently, and I looked up the quotes, trying to figure out where it came from, and it's attributed to different people, so I don't know who exactly said it first. But here's the saying, there's no success without a successor. There's no success without a successor, meaning that you don't fully succeed unless there's someone else to continue the work after you. And this applies to parenting, it applies to business, and it applies to ministry as well. So prepare yourself and prepare the next generation, the people who will take over after you. May God raise up a new generation of giants who will be able to take over so that the previous generation can move on. Thirdly and finally, praise on. Praise on. David closes his life in ministry with words of praise and thanksgiving. How fitting that he finishes his life writing psalms writing songs of praise. One of those Psalms, Psalm 147, verse 1, he says, Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise Him. 
How pleasant and fitting to praise Him. Whatever else you may not know, you can always know this. It's always a good time to praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, today we praise You. Come what may, whatever may be happening all around us, we praise You. We worship You. We bless You. And we welcome Your plan for our lives. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We commit our lives to You once again. And we thank You, Lord, for all that we're learning in Scripture. Help us now, Lord to fight on, to move on, and to praise on. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, church. God loves you. I love you. This church loves you. Have a great Sunday. And we will see you again throughout the week for prayer, Bible study, and other things. God bless you.